Stanford University. So we have our first guest speaker of the quarter here today, Phil Wickham, right here. Hello, Phil. So, I um, pretty like up closer, maybe. Okay. okay. So, okay. Um, so, so much pressure. <laughs> Um, so Phil's this amazing individual I got a chance to know um, initially a couple years ago through the Coffin Fellows Program, of which um, he spent a number of years serving as both president and CEO of the organization. Uh, the mission of the organization is to develop the next generation of leaders in venture capital. I believe they've had a lot of success doing so. If you look at some of the general partners at firms on Sand Hill Road, um, people who've started VC funds internationally and also people who've landed on the Forbes Midas list for top venture capitalists, Phil has been there all the way helping train and support and um, lead the next generation of leaders in venture capital. Um, also had a very successful time just leading the program because during the time he expanded the program into more than 50 countries and quadrupled both its operating budget and membership. And um, now the society has almost 1,000 professionals and 200 billion in aggregate capital under management. A lot of money. Um, so early in Phil's career, he co-founded a publishing company in Tokyo called Reference Media in Japan. Um, he grew and scaled and sold it to Princeton Review, where he became vice president of sales for Japan and Korea. He's also had experience in venture capital, initially serving as a general partner at JAFCO American Ventures, which is a billion dollar fund um, led by a number of leading Japanese technology uh, players and a number of investments, um, including uh, companies like um, Square, Twitter, Palantir, Handshake, and 40 plus more investments. And, and, a, and uh, a bunch of bad ones I don't mention. So, <laughs> so um, he's also been um, involved on the LP side of things in terms of he helped conceive um, staff and seed fund Truebridge Capital Partners, which is a fund to fund that manages over one and a half billion in um, family, uh, family offices. Um, based in North Carolina, and most recently he founded and um, leads a venture capital fund called Sozo Ventures, which he'll talk a little bit about, um, which has had a lot of success. And um, so in general, just um, excited to have Phil here today just because he has had a lot of experience um, on both the venture capital side, um, training VCs, um, seeing things happen internationally, also seeing things on the LP side and fund to fund side. But I think one of the most impressive things about Phil is um, he's really, if you look at the title of the talk, um, behavioral and emotional fitness and kind of the importance of that for venture capital. And um, he's able to dive in not just on, we've covered a lot about kind of the technical aspects of venture capital, um, but then really being able to provide, I guess, more of the EQ, um, intelligence, importance of venture capital. So, we'll see. Yeah. We'll see. Well, good. Ernestine, thank you very much. Um, as you guys might know, Ernestine was one of our rock star fellows, so it's kind of funny to see this come full circle like six years ago, and here I am again. And I actually used to mentor a class in here, uh, MSC 273, like five years ago. Anybody know Ann Mira Co? Audrey McLean taught it, so I, I mentored that here. Um, I, t I talked to Ernestine a little bit about the room, but I'd just like to get a sense, because I know there's a, there's a mix of, of sort of, of uh, experiences in academic levels here. So can I just see a quick show of hands of the, the undergrads in the room? Okay, so the undergrads are right down the middle. Okay. And, and how many of you sort of technical in nature? So most of you. Okay, how about graduate students? I know Simon is. Okay. And then there's like the other, like the fellows and the, the, the research fellows and things like that. And you're with the journalism program, right? Yeah, Ernestine filled me in. Great. Um, so I, I, Ernestine and I chat a little bit about what, I mean, basically what I can, I can give to you. A couple of ground rules. First of all, you'll, you'll, you'll have these slides in your inbox in their entirety when you're done, so don't feel compelled to, to write everything down. Um, what I'm going to share with you are just opinions of 25-ish years of doing this kind of stuff, and most of my opinions are curated opinions of other experts. So take them at, take them at face value. Um, there are no, I'm not here to give you any answers. I don't think anybody, venture is so unique and there's so many different ways. I don't think anybody provides an answer, but they should provide some disruption. And hopefully you take some frameworks away that'll be useful to you. So I'm gonna try to disrupt you a little bit today. Um, the other, one other thing I like to do is, I found in the years, this happens everywhere, but in innovation in particular, um, there's a lot of common words that get used, and it's interesting when you actually watch people debate and you, you talk to them afterwards and you find out they were using the same word, but they had very different definitions of that word. 
And so the conversation they had was almost meaningless. In fact, it might have been destructive because they think they agree and they don't agree. So I'm going to spend a little time going through some phrases here to make sure that we're all sort of aligned. And, and again, mine, these are just my working, my working definitions of phrases. And so I suggest when you talk to people is to make sure when somebody uses things like words like risk or even venture capital, like, what do you mean by that? Yeah, it would be funny. It's funny how that works. What, um, I've got a lot of things on here. I probably have about, um, I could probably blow through these slides in 30 minutes, and they'll give us a lot of time to talk. Um, I took a guess at stuff that might be interesting, but would you guys just help me out, like throw out, you know, what, like help me understand what goes on in this class. Why are you here? And, and what do you want to get out of it, right? You're here on a beautiful, you know, California afternoon. You could be outside. Instead, you're here. So what, what can we do this afternoon that will make this a great afternoon? Help me out. Just throw them out. Ideas, what questions are you sitting in? What would you, what would you, what's one question you'd love to answer? Yeah. So I think this is very pertinent given that you're talking about behavioral emotional fitness, but one of the things that I am sort of ambiguous at best about regarding the C and a lot of this stuff is um, A, fear that it could be too much of a good old boys club, and B, that there can be destructive mentality, sort of like what you say at Rothenberg Ventures. Destructive or mentality. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I was hoping you could touch on maybe both alleviation of that or things that people in VC are working to. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess alleviate is the yeah. word here. So just a, a quick synopsis of that, alleviation of this effect of the old boys network, which if you talk to the Kaufman Fellows Program, you're, 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 you're talking our language. Um, and also, how, what do we do about the destructive behavior, which I think is very interesting because one of the, one of the sort of truths about venture is it's, it's very slow, it is very unstructured, and it's very ungoverned. And it's incredibly important that we, that we prevent those kinds of things from happening. And there was a big battle with um, the Jobs Act in terms of pushing back the, the kind of the SEC's desire to come in and regulate us more. And Kate Mitchell and others in the NVCA did a great job backing it up. Yeah, go ahead. I have a question. Do you have a rule for the industry? Oh, and sorry, tell me your name. Uh, I'm Nicholas, sorry. Nicholas? Okay. And do you have a role model in the industry? And why do you, do you think he succeeds so well? Okay. She succeeds so well. Do I have a role model in the industry, and why do I think they succeed so well? So yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to these. And tell me your name. I'm Andrew. Andrew? OK, I'm trying to remember. Anju, right? Anju, yeah, okay. hi. Um, See, I'm terrible with names. So if I, <laughs> if I can remember these, it'll be good. No, just be yourself wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm more interested in it from an international perspective. Um, since the whole uh, you know, the VC world is just starting to grow in Asia and, uh, and Africa, how does one take the, the, best, um, the best of Silicon Valley overseas and not take the... Yeah, so how do we take, yeah, overseas. given the growth of international venture, how do we take the best of Silicon Valley but not just make the sort of the blind assumption we can repot what we do here yeah, in and Africa and Asia? Make that into another uh, yeah. old boys club of the US guys overseas. Something we spend a lot of time on. So I hand back there, yeah. Your name? Deepa. Deepa. And I'm interested in sort of understanding what considerations VCs take into account when they decide which investments to go with and which ones uh, you know, yeah. they choose to pass on. Yeah. I work in tech in uh, state government in the US. Okay. And um, I think tech innovation is a little bit, takes a little while to, to catch up in the state government sector. So just really interested in knowing sure. what types of investments would you know, yield. Yeah. Uh, so, so essentially, what are the criteria or the sort of things we look at? And yeah. what I can do is I can, the best I can do is I can share the way we think about it at, at Sozo, which is everyone has slightly different approaches, but they're still basically the, you know, it doesn't vary that much. So I saw a hand over here. I'll come back over there. Hey, I'm Chris. Hi, Chris. Uh, yeah, you mentioned that you've helped develop a lot of great VCs, and although VCs is pretty unique in nature, I was wondering if there are any common characteristics Sure. Uh, com so question is common characteristics. It's the heart of my presentation. So is it OK if we wait to get yeah. to that? Yeah. No, it's actually we, we've, we've spent 20 plus years sort of asking that question. And so I'll, 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 I'll show you some of the stuff that we've discovered. So yeah, go ahead. My name is Akash. Um, yeah. say, say it again. Akash. Akash. Okay. Um, I'm wondering how you guys uh, build teams and also evaluate teams. OK. Uh, so how do we build teams or evaluate teams that we invest in? So for our stage, we, we do sort of readiness stage. And so we're, we're, we don't do a lot of building. We do a lot of evaluation. But I'm 
happy to share that with you. I said, hey, you had to, do you have your hand up? Yes. Yeah. My name is Jiang. So I say, say it again. Jiang. Jiang. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I have a question now. Um, it relates to the uh, general ecosystem of PC uh, industry. So how do you think of the current uh, ecosystem status within uh, the PC industry? And if there are things that you want to change about it, then I need to innov innov innovate the, the ecosystem, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, so, so the question is, how do we, how do I think about the current ecosystem of venture capital, and and so there's a lot in there. Can you can you unpack that a little bit for me? What do you mean by? I just want to keep the pretty broad. Like, what do you think you want to keep? Maybe you want to change certain practices or how the relationship between VCs and ventures and like whatever you think that would be. Okay. Sure, how we can make it better so and how some, better relationships. Some context on this question is yeah. she's doing her PhD thesis on this. Okay. So she's asking okay. for the answer for her thesis. Oh, okay. Oh, <laughs> do I get like co-authoring rights if I give you a good answer? <laughs> Hi, Ron. Hi, Ron. I, uh, what do you think about corporate venture capital? Venture capital? So I spent the last couple of years with Celgene Corporation. Say, so what, what venture capital? Corporate. Venture. Yeah, okay. Inside large pharmacies. Yeah, yeah. How do you look at them from yeah. outside? No, it's a great question. In fact, I was just meeting with uh, one of the fellows today who is deeply in that space. And I actually think that this, uh, the question is, is, what do I think about corporate venture? And there's a lot to talk about there. So, so I'll, I'll come back to that. But it's, it's actually, I think it's, I think it's very interesting. And I think it's very underestimated and underwatched what's happened in corporate venture, especially in the last 10 years. So. Uh, so right now, if you look around, kind of from all the roses, right? Times are pretty good. Yeah. You see, um, good valuations, pretty good exits as far as the acquisitions front. How do you think about your strategy? And how will you pivot that in times? Aren't sure. Good? So, the, uh, so, yep. So, yeah. So, so. The, the observation is, yeah, things are are pretty good. You're obviously pretty young. You weren't around in '98 when it was really good. Yeah. It didn't last long, but it was good. But yeah, there's that's a great question. How do we think about? Our strategy and, and how do we um, yeah. how will we manage to when? Be more specific on that. Like, you know, do you feel liquidity constraints? So do you have enough money as VC, right? Because you're waiting for the acquisition events. Yeah. How do you think about your strategy and framework during the? Sure. Between do we feel liquidity constrained? Do we feel? Yeah. I mean, there's a, and there's a lot going on there. And I think I think you know one of the one of the observations I make is. The, the, for, for those of us who are around during you know, the internet bubble, and there's you know, people you'll get to talk to, I think Bill Draper's coming in. Bill Draper was around for a lot of bubbles. Um, and uh, <laughs> you know, I think one of the mistakes that people make is they look at the current bubble in, through the lens of the previous bubble. And so when I hear people talk about, hey, this is 98 all over again, there's something going on, but it isn't 98 all over again. And so it requires some thinking. So let me take a couple more and then we can keep, I'll, I'll, I'll let me get, yeah, go ahead, Simon. Um, so I was wondering what you thought, like what your vision is for the most promising emerging technologies. Like what are the big okay. things you want to invest Okay, we can talk about that. Some of, some, at least what we see are the emerging technologies. And, and just, to, just to qualify that, I mean, we do a little bit later stage, so we, we don't live on the bleeding edge of what's happening, but we can, I can certainly give you some ideas of where we see things getting traction globally, which I think is also a pretty interesting indicator. Yeah, let me just go with these two guys and then we'll, we'll, I'll, weave, I'll weave back to you. You can interrupt me anytime you want. Um, I'm wondering what you think about- Come again? Um, my name is Josh. Josh. I'm wondering what you think of accelerators. Do you think there are too many or too few and what role do they play? So what do I think of accelerators or the too many or too few? Yeah, well, we'll, we'll let's, let's talk about that. That's a good question. I'm, I'm, I'm fundamentally a big fan of them, um, you know, I, I, but, but there are a lot of them, right? So uh, do you guys know StartX? So Cameron Teitelman's a Kaufman Fellow, so it's biased towards StartX, because I think they're really good. So go ahead, what's your name? Uh, Josh, Josh also. Josh, um, okay, okay that would be easy to remember. Yeah. See, Josh uh, is in the gray shirts, okay. Yeah. Uh, which companies do you wish were in your portfolio? Uh, <laughs> yeah, oh gosh. Okay, which company, I'll tell you. I mean, I can give you my, you guys familiar, I think it's Bessemer does the anti-portfolio. Anti -portfolio. Yeah, I can give you my anti-portfolio. I have a bunch of them like, oh God, why did I do that deal and not this deal? So, all right, let me, let me kick off. Um, so one of the things that I ask people who speak to the fellows is to just give a quick sense of their journey so you guys know who you're talking to. So I'm gonna do that for you. Have any of you ever done um, a timeline exercise? Anybody done a timeline icebreaker exercise? You get together, no one, any, none of you guys have done a timeline exercise, okay? So, so here, I'll show, you, I'll show you what it looks like. So this is a timeline. So 
basically what I do is I take all my ages and I'm going to just show you, this is really quick, if you do it together in a group, you do it in much more depth, but just gives you a little sense of where I've been in my life, okay? So when I was zero, so this is like good and bad. So when I was zero, I was born, so that was a highlight of my life. Um, life, was, life was good, and then about six, I'm from, anybody from the Northeast, like upstate New York? Yeah. Where? Yeah. So, so I started playing hockey when I was about six, and I loved hockey, so this was a highlight of my life. And, and life was good, and then about 12, my Little League team won the city championship, and we were undefeated, and that was great. And then I went from my cushy little elementary school to a city middle school, and I started to just get bullied like nobly. I had people, guy put a cigarette out on my neck, um, barely escaped a sexual assault. I mean, it was really, really bad time in my life. And, I, and it's interesting because I spent, it, 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 it created a, a kind of an introverted side of me that I think still in some ways serves me. Um, and I spent most of my teen years just sort of living inside myself. And also I, I found a lot of, a, a lot of respite in, in playing sports. And, and, but then when I was 18, I got my first real girlfriend and so that was a big highlight. Um, so, so yeah, then I started, I started as an engineer, I was an mechanical, aerospace mechanical engineer. I didn't like my first couple years of school. I have pretty severe ADHD, I'm a bad, I've always been a bad student. Um, but then around, um, around 20, I got into sort of the upper division classes and into more sort of large systems and it just, the first time in my life academically, I ever felt like this is easy, like this is fun. And so that, that was something I remember very clearly. Um, and I, I, I eventually graduated from school. I, I, I moved to Japan and around 25, a bunch of interesting things started to happen to me. Um, I sold my company in Japan, which was kind of a weird ride, but it got really fun in that year. Um, I met the woman who became my wife in Japan. Um, and in all that period, and then I, I sort of gained access to the Kauffman Fellows, and that was really fun. Um, and life just cruised along until I was about 30, and then it was okay. I probably should have done a lower point, because my, my wife and I were struggling with um, having kids, and it didn't look like we could have kids, and that was actually a really tough period for us, and for those of you who've ever been through it, or when you go through it, it's really, really tough. Um, but then Alyssa came, so my daughter came when I was 35, so that was really cool. Um, and then, then we hit the jackpot again, and Emily came, and then when we were eight and a half months pregnant with Emily, um, Jafco blew up, and I got basically fired. I mean, it was a big political thing, but I basically walked in one day and said, you're done. So that sucked. Um, and that was the first time in my life that, I mean, this was completely out of the blue. And this is a fund that in that period had returned about 15x cash on cash. It's one of the best performing funds of all time. Um, and so that was not fun. And then I kind of, this is, and so this is, we're in like 2000, 2001. So we're, we're in like the direct aftermath of the implosion. It is, it is nuclear winter in Silicon Valley, the worst I've ever seen it. And so I kind of struggled and found an interesting opportunity in Europe and we built out a fund there doing some things. And then eventually that didn't take off and it blew up. And I did a, I went through a really interesting coaching process for about a year. And one of the things I figured out was, I'm not really an investor per se, I actually enjoy the teaching process more. And so it doesn't really matter what organization I'm in or what label you call me, it's just the function, my, what I would call, we'll talk about genius a little bit, well, my comfort zone and my zone of genius was in, it was in teaching. And I started looking for opportunities to go back to operations and I ended up having a conversation with a board member at Kaufman where I had been on the board for six years and had just left. And I ended up getting the CEO position there. Um, it was a pretty tough time because it's now it's, it was, I took the job in March of 2008 and I remember flying to Sweden and when I left New York, Lehman Brothers existed and when I landed it didn't. <laughs> I remember just landing and seeing that on my phone, and I went, okay, this is, this is actually important. This is, this is bad, what's happening here. And so it was a pretty interesting time to build a, a nonprofit <laughs> sort of financial services education organization. And one of the interesting things that happened is we, we did what everybody else did. Some of you guys are old enough to remember this. But that, from that period of September 
to December 2008, I think in, this, in the Valley set a world record for offsite meetings. Like you couldn't talk to anybody because they were always in offsite, like pulling their hair out and freaking out about how the world is coming to an end. Um, but, in, but what actually happened, and this is, as you know, if, you've, if any of you work in education, the demand moves inversely to, to economic stability. And so we grew like a weed after this. And, and our view was, the, you know, the, the pushback was, oh man, it's gonna be tough. It's, it's a tough market. And m my view was, if, if this leads to the end of innovation, then we got bigger problems. We're gonna be hunting dinner with a stick. I mean, it's gonna be really bad. And it turned out that people doubled down on innovation. So it was a pretty cool thing. Um, and then really started to take off when I was about 48, and that's when I, I co-founded um, Sozo with a Japanese partner. I'll talk for a couple minutes about that. And then it's been pretty good. So I, I, just, I just turned 53 on October 3rd, so, so there you go. So that, that is a quick snapshot of my life. Um, this is the logo of my venture fund, Sozo. And this is kind of what we do, it's pretty simple. We sit between two communities of, of, of organizations, large Asian corporations that want to access technology trends and startups so that they can basically compete more efficiently in the global markets. And on the US side, um, cutting edge startups that want to leverage Asian markets to become global leaders. And most of what I do there is set up platforms for teaching. Mostly we teach those two constituencies and in the process of teaching and learning about them, we see a lot of interesting investment opportunities. And I have some stuff later on. Okay, so I'm gonna try to, you know, when Ernestine and I talked about this, I'm gonna try to just use this session to relate um, things that I've learned and we've learned. So, so I have two questions for you, okay? What is, what is venture capital? So Linus, you have, a, you have a venture capital job. When your grandmother calls you, she's 80 years old. Where's your, do you have a grandmother alive? Okay, so someone old who knows you, living in the middle of nowhere, and they call you and say, you tell them, I'm a venture capitalist now. What, do you, what is venture capital? What do you tell them? I take, I'll, I'll tell them that I take money from other rich individuals, pension funds, and uh, things like that, and I give that to entrepreneurs that are trying to take big risks and try to change the world. Okay. Robin Hood. Exactly. <laughs> Any, anybody else? I mean, there's a lot of ways you can describe it. Anybody else have a, have, they'd add on to that, or? Yeah. Helping companies to develop themselves by giving them some yeah, helping companies develop stuff, giving them, giving them money, raises a question of what is capital? I mean, financial capital, is there any other forms of capital that get mobilized by venture capitalists? Say again. Human capital. Human capital is a big one. What else? I think mental capital, too. Yeah, in what form? Lots of that. Advice. Advice, Advice. frameworks, yeah. patterns, um, mental capital in the form of structured mental capital, like intellectual capital, yeah. right? Cultural capital, list goes on and on and on. So, so yeah, I think, I think these are, you know, these are all right. What else might you add to the definition? Like, is it, is it, do you have to be a certain kind of structure? Like, is an accelerator fund venture capital, or am I, am I venture capital because I have a bunch of standard institutional LPs? Is it just, just us, like firms like us, firms like Ernestine's, or do you throw angels? Are angels venture capitalists? Right. So I don't know what the answer is, but I mean, there are people who will argue that anybody who mobilizes any form of capital to help companies accelerate could be called a venture capitalist. People in governments. Um, Endeavor, anybody familiar with Endeavor out of New York? The, they do developing world stuff. Venture capitalists without the capital, right? So second question, who is the venture capitalist customer? I love this one. Who's the customer? The LPs, okay. Why do you say that? There's no answer. There's no. There's one of two possible answers, but. And so they have a fiduciary responsibility to give returns. Back. Right. Would anybody take? I've heard people. This kind of goes 50/50, right? Some people. I kind of argue that way that it's the LPs, but how else? Who else could you argue is the customer? The entrepreneur. The entrepreneur, right? How would you make that argument? Because uh, in some sense, the entrepreneur, if they have a good idea, potentially has multiple options of yeah. uh, people that they could go to to get intellectual and uh, financial capital. So in some sense, um, you know, it could shift that way as well, where they're the customer and they're choosing between yeah. multiple pieces. Well, it, it, and uh, yeah, that's exactly right. They have these options, especially if they're very good, mm -hmm. right? Andrew? Also because um, 
you you are taking risks to produce a certain return and to get to that return the entrepreneurs are your key customers to be able to deliver to your LPs. Right. I mean, I think the, this, the answer is, I mean, the, one, one truth is that the entrepreneurs are the ones that matter, right? We as an industry, and this, I kind of tend, and Ernest, and you probably know this from hanging around with me, I tend to have a very wide kind of blanket definition of what is venture capital. I'll let anyone in the tent who invests in and support entrepreneurs, I'm like, yeah, you're a venture capitalist, come on in. I'm okay with that. And entrepreneurs are the ones we serve and they're the ones that matter. The way I, the re, the way I articulate this, and it's just me, but I, I, I view the customer as the LP because I view myself as a money manager. And I view the journey I go on with the entrepreneur as my product. And if I select and go on amazing journeys, I produce a lot of good products and then I will produce wealth in return to my LPs. But it's just an intellectual, just an intellectual exercise. I could, I'm just as, just as good with somebody saying, you know, our customer's the entrepreneur, we take care of the entrepreneur, everything else, and these guys are just our investors. Okay, I'm good with that too. But I think it's, it's just interesting that you'll see people take different approaches on this. So, when I was transitioning, I've transitioned the CEO role of Kaufman to a younger fellow from class 16, and, and I had a coach, and he, he, when I was on the way out, he said, he, he's one of these guys, I mean, you probably know these people, he's, he's very much like a so what type. Okay, he did all this stuff, so what? Tell me, like, what matters? What are the things you've learned? So this goes to your question. What are the things you've learned about the greats? Okay, and I'm gonna answer the question about my role models too when I do this. So we found three things, okay? And it's not rocket science. Um, first one is radical self-belief. And all that means is you really know who you are and you're willing to put all of your chips on you, okay? So, one of the people I really admire, there's many I really admire, but one, I think probably the most widely admired venture capitalist, and I hope he doesn't mind me saying this because it's on film, um, is Mike Maples at Floodgate, who's a Stanford grad. Um, I just think is, has such clarity on who he is, and he's so bold, um, he's totally unafraid to bet on himself, and he's had ridiculous success, and also one of the, probably all around, one of the nicest people you ever meet, right? So, the things that we have people search for in our process and we search for as we select them is something called zones of genius and, and zones of passion, right? Anybody done a zone of genius exercise? Oh, you guys are fun, man. I guess this is good. You're going to have some stuff to take away from this. All right, so humans, this is um, borrowing someone's framework and I may not get this perfectly right, but basically humans operate on, three, on four levels. Zone of incompetence, zone of competence, zone of excellence, and zone of genius. The first three are all things that you don't naturally do well. So if you ask somebody, what's your genius? They'll almost always tell you what their excellence is, right? You guys are all at Stanford, so there's probably a bunch of stuff you're not naturally good at. You just worked really hard, and so you got better than most people. But I'm guessing still, in spite of the talent in this room, most of you haven't come close to tapping into your genius. Anybody want to guess why? Why is genius so hard to find? in any individual. So let me take a guess. Are they getting graded in this class? Okay, still, don't be afraid to guess. You'll get a, you'll get a higher grade if you guess. Why do you think? The probability is so low so that you need a very large group to find one genius. Oh, no, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. How do you find it in yourself, though? Why is it so hard to see it in yourself? Because it's not required in the day-to-day -day life. That's a great answer, right? That's the first half of the answer is our systems, we, we, everything we grow up in, right, is industrial, right? Industrial is all about tasks and it doesn't, there's no reward, there's no incentive, okay? So that, there's nothing that helps you to find it, right? Does it not fit nicely? Tell, tell me your name. My name is Laura. Laura. Um, does it not fit nicely into categories? No, it doesn't fit nicely into? Categories. It, it's you're, you're, yeah, you're kind of on the right path. Um, it, it's a really deceptive word because it doesn't fit into categories because when people hear it, they tend to think of things like superpowers and it's not that. It actually fits in, here's sort of the, the punchline is, it fits into really standard categories and it's so obvious to you that you can't believe it's special. So when you do a genius exercise, this happened, I've done this in groups all the time and people, you'll, you'll feed it back to somebody Here's your genius of like, 
doesn't everybody do that? You're like, no, you're the only person in the world who does, right? So here's, here's a, um, who has heard of flow? Okay, good, all right? So this is an incredibly useful tool, and here's how you can use it. This is actually, you, you can do this at home, you won't get hurt, okay? You reverse engineer your genius, okay? So what flow basically says, this is my interpretation, but and, and, and did, any, did any of you guys watch the little video, the five minute video, did you send those out? So I sent a little video out, if you didn't see it, you can watch it afterwards. But it basically says, as you move up the chain of your, your abilities towards your genius, and as you move up challenges that I think also are close to your passions, the, the further, the deeper you go into that, the more you're into flow. And flow is def defined as a sort of blissful state that's that's so great that you lose track of space and time. And it can be playing a musical instrument, it can be a social event, it can be a sporting event, it doesn't matter, right? So you've all had, everyone's had moments, can you just reflect and like, have you had moments of bliss where you've been doing something, you look up the clock and go, where did four hours go? I hope you've had, tell me you've had that. Hope you've had some bliss in your life. You can't be at Stanford and not have some bliss, right? So if you actually go and, and jot down in a journal eight to 10 memories, you will start to see patterns form around environment and skills. And all of a sudden, you'll start to see things that you, you never thought were, were really very interesting. So give it a try. Here's number two, and this extends from number one. Um, the people who have radical self-belief are able to go off and do things that are novel and a lot of times against the grain, a lot of times they're counterintuitive, um, but you also have to have the tools and frameworks to go and build that. And you know, Mike Maples will tell you, if you've ha ever heard him speak, he'll, talk, you know, he'll show you his deck when he first raised Floodgate, which back then was Maple Investments, with his microventure model and how everybody laughed him out of the room. Or my friend Jason Green, who was my classmate, um, founded a fund called Emergence Capital Partners, was you know, basically founded conceived 2002 as a SaaS fund. Back then he called it technology-enabled services, so like utility in the wall, software in the wall, but eventually became SaaS in the cloud. Laughed out of the room for two or three years. Um, you know, they just, they just produced an 8x cash on cash fund. They're doing, doing fantastic. They're probably the brand in the space. Um, so, and this can happen at the fund level or it can happen at the deal level. Yeah. And the third one, and this is, this is where the rubber hits the road, and this is an extension. If you are going to come up with something novel, our entire asset base in the venture world is talent, is people. And so if you have a novel thesis, you're going to need, well, it stems from that, you're going to need a novel talent environment. And so you have to be able to design it. So design thinking is critical, right? Uh, you're going to have to build it. There's two ways you can build a talent environment, right? You can cold call. If you have like 30 people to go after this new thesis, you can cold call all of them. Or what's a faster way? It's a faster way to get to those 30 people. No people who know people. References, baby. Yeah, don't shout it out, man. Don't be afraid. It's exactly the right answer, right? But. What does it take to get a great person to connect you to a great person? Being a great person. What's that? Being a great person. Being a great person, right? <laughs> having the trust, having the reputation, right? right? And at the end of it, all that really matters, and this is what we would argue, is that there is a design and optimization of those individual relationships. So you can do all this great stuff. You can do all this fantastic stuff with radical self-belief and novel theses and all this great design stuff, but if you can't manage a relationship, you're not, you just, we, we just don't think it's gonna work. So, so what's the point of all this? Have you guys seen this body of data from Correlation Ventures? You guys seen this, this distribution? So what it basically says is, this is these, are, these are a decade of deals from 2004 to 2013 says the top 4% of all the deals done in venture were 10x cash on cash or better. What do LPs care about, cash on cash or IRR? Cash on cash. Most of them, they don't, IRR is very deceiving. Cash on cash is what really matters. The next 6% are 
five to 10x, and then the next 25%, you get your money back to 5x. So what conclusions can we draw from this graph? Shout them out. That a, a small number of your investors, or the, like, it's, it's unlikely that all your investments will do well, and you only have like, a couple of heavy hitters. It's unlikely that all your investors will do well, unless. Unless. Unless what? You, you choose the top 4%. You choose them, everybody chooses them, right? You're able to get to them. Get access to them, right? You gotta get in the door. What else can we conclude from this graph? How, how, now what's the basic talent makeup of the venture environment, in venture environment? I mean, in terms of education, IQ, work ethic. What's the average venture capitalist like? I mean, generally pretty smart. A lot of them come out of places like Stanford and Harvard, right? So what is this, what's interesting about this chart? Uh, they're super smart, but even they don't know with 100% certainty which ones are going to be those 10x returns. Yeah, 96% yeah. of them don't. They either don't know or they don't. They don't get that. Did you just imagine that? We have something similar. Like only a third even yield like any semblance of a return, and in that, uh, so 35% very small. Yep. Percentage yep. What What else can you What else can you draw from this graph? I mean, think about like think about other professions, right? What else can you draw from this graph? You need a very high aptitude for taking risk. There's, there's high aptitude for risk. What about down here? What about being here? Right. It's not okay to be average. It's not okay to be average. It's bad to be average, right? If you're average in Major League Baseball, is it okay? If you bat like 250 and you have a, yeah, you can play for like 20 years and you'll make money, you'll be okay, right? It's, it's, it's not good to be average in the venture world, right? So that's, I think that's one of the things that's very interesting about this, okay? And, and keep in mind that, that any, any sailors in the room? Anybody like sail? So you ever heard this old adage about sailing, Nicholas? It's uh, hours of boredom punctuated by moments of sheer terror. <laughs> that's one of my sailing friends told me that. And you can talk to people in the military who've been in combat, you can talk to firemen, whatever it is. And in a sense, venture is kind of the same way. It's not this clean, but basically, when you do this for a long time, most of your existence is in this kind of grinding boredom. And you don't get a lot of feedback one way or the other on these companies. You, you know, you're always, I'm sure, Ernestine, they do this at you know, Alsa Blue. We do it all the time. Like you, you have a portfolio of companies, and you take a snapshot, and half of them look like they're going to take over the world, and half of them look like they're going to die. And then the next year you look and you still have half of them look like they're going to take over the world and half of them look like they're going to die, but they all switch places, right? <laughs> but they never, very rarely do they, they succeed and very rarely do they die. They just, they just kind of grind along. But at some point there is this moment where they can take over the world or they can go off of a cliff, right? And that's where, that's where everything is built in terms of what people think of you. Um, it is amazing, it's amazing what people do in those moments. I've been lucky enough to see greats in those moments and it just dazzles me how they're able to keep things calm and aligned and I've seen some really good people who are great on a board for three years completely melt down, right? So, so let me ask you guys a question. Um, does anybody have a relationship in their life that has drama? Like just unnecessary drama. Your mother, your brother. Tell me about your 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 relationship with drama. You don't have to like go into specifics, but like. Um, well, okay. Or it could be. Uh, tell me about your friend with the the okay. drama relationship. Um, so I have. I mean, I have a friend who is has consistently been interested in me for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and so what do you, how would you characterize the behavior, the behavior is, how does it manifest itself? Um, I don't know, there's a lot of like, staring, at the first, trying to see staring at this, reaching out like, oh, I haven't talked to a while, how are you doing? And like, you're the only one who says that consistently every few weeks. Yeah. So it's like, patterns, patterns of her career. Like, and how does that make you feel, or how does that make your friend feel about that relationship? <laughs> Um, it's a little exhausting sometimes, 
would yeah. say we, we, are, we are good friends is the thing. Okay, so no, it's just, like, I, I, yeah, I'm close friends with business. Okay, so stop for a minute and imagine this relationship is extremely healthy. Like as good as it could be, how much better would it be? Like 10%? What? 10%? It'd be like at least 50%. Right? 50% better. Okay, who else has a good, like, we all have drama in our lives, right? Who else has one? Come on. No? All right, so I'll show you something. All right, so I've, I, this is not scientific, although I think there's a cool PhD study to do here someday, but I would basically, your, your number was fine. It sort of says, you know, there's a 33%, you said it could be 50% better, so it's 33% drama tax on that particular relationship. Um, and it, it's amazing to me, once, once you develop the lens for this, how much drama people allow into their lives, how much drama they commit to, even though they complain about it a lot, okay? And so if you buy into the logic of what I've said, which is you need to have radical self-belief, you need to convert that into novel theses, you need to convert that into talent environments, and the talent environments totally function on the strength of the relationship, then if you're guilty of this, how do you get to the top, you know, how do you get to the 90th percentile if your relationships are capped at the 50th or 70th percentile? And I would argue most people fail in the business because they don't pick up on this. And no one tells you when you're not a great person. If you don't, if you don't pull that off in an interaction, you don't get an email and no one calls you and goes, hey, you know, you could have done that better. They just avoid you. And then that issue of access all of a sudden doesn't happen. And that's why I think a lot of the people who are truly great in this business are truly great people because they, they keep gaining access. Okay. Have you guys, anybody familiar with David Rock or Scarf? Has anybody seen this? So the thesis is all drama extends from fear and all fear extends from fear of what? What do you think? Fear of? Really obvious. What's that? Fear. Worse. That's what you guys worry about. Worse than fear of failure. Fear of death. Fear of death. Right? So what has the brain evolved to do? The brain has evolved to keep us alive. Right? From the innards of our lizard brain, which is kind of where, we, where scarf takes you, you know, to all the way out to our prefrontal cortex. You know, most of the stuff we do with, with community and empathy is about creating advantage, because, you know, what is it about our species, right? We're slow, we're soft, we got no sort of natural weapons, we're better when we team up than when we're alone, right? Ten of us versus a saber-toothed tiger is better than one-on-one, -on -one, right? So, Scarf, I, I love this, I love this. Um, I sent you guys a quick video, you can look at this as well. Um, Again, once you have the lens to look for this and you're, you're, you're watching dysfunction in high pressure environments, SCARF seems to explain like 90, 98% of the problem to me. Like I can look at somebody and go, oh man, that person just threatened that person's status. And you know, it doesn't take much to threaten someone's status. It can be very inadvertent, right? I could be talking to you and just go, you know, well, if I just go like that, just roll my eyes for like a microsecond, you know, that's, that's massively threatening to anybody. Right? I could just, you know, you could be talking to me and I just turn and talk to somebody else, right? Um, certainty, there, you know, and everybody has, everybody reacts to these. These are, these are primordial threat responses. Everybody reacts to them, but we react to them kind of differently, like everyone has a fingerprint, right? So certainty, just like it sounds. Some people can operate, who, who feels, who feels status oriented here? Who feels like the, your status is important to you? Are you guys proud that you're at Stanford? You should be, it's pretty, pretty statusy, right? Pretty cool, right? Um, how, many, how many feel like you need to operate in certainty or you're okay in ambiguity? You like certainty? Too much. <laughs> yeah. Who, who sort of thrives in ambiguity? Who feels like they're comfortable? Right. I get accused of that a lot, like you're so good in ambiguity, but actually I really, really need certainty, but I, I just, I don't really, I don't mean not to show it, but I, I do a lot of scenario planning on everything, and so if I get surprised, I'm not a happy person. I don't like surprise. Autonomy, don't threaten my autonomy. Relatedness is, are you friend or foe? And I can operate pretty well in that level of ambiguity, but some people just can't open up to somebody unless they really know, 
you know, is it the meet the parents, you know, inside the circle of trust they need to know. And you see different cultures, different cultures operate differently. I do a lot of work in Japan and it's not, there isn't the kind of, um, there isn't the kind of, you know, sort of beta model of, hey, let's, let's see, you seem like a nice guy, let's see how this goes. I mean, you're gonna go through a lot of due diligence and then once you're in, you're in. But it's, it's a long, and then fairness. We're, we're really wired for fairness as a species. Here's another cool thing. This is, so this goes to, I love this, and this is useful for you as you think about drama in your life. There's a couple different models here. This is David Emerald's. I use Diana Chapman as the video I sent you guys. But it basically says, Diana calls it um, villain, hero, and victim. It's all the same thing. But what it basically says is drama, the dreaded trauma triangle goes in these three directions. And so when people are under threat, which more often than not is scarf related, I mean, it's just my opinion, um, they tend to end up in one of these places. And so as you think about the drama with this friend, you know, is there, sometimes it's one, but oftentimes you can have a foot in two or more. And this, I like this, the reason I included this is I basically what you see reflected above is how you take the energy of somebody who is villainous and you, it, when you're being the villain, how do you turn yourself into a challenger? How do you turn yourself into somebody positive? Right? If you feel like the victim, how can you sit there and say, what, what, am I, what is this here for? What am I here to learn? How do, I, how do I turn this into something good? And the hero is, don't give them the fish, coach, teach them how to fish. Not complicated. But these are, I think these are, are interesting things that you'll see. Let's, so let's change direction a little bit. Um, any you guys ever taken any storytelling classes? Anybody do any, like, what is the role, what is narrative and what is its role in innovation? What do you think? Does anybody know who Joseph Campbell is? Who's Joseph Campbell? Do you know, do you know his storytelling model? No, 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 that's, that's, um, that's Bill Campbell. No, Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell. Uh, the Hero's Journey. The Hero's Journey. Joseph Campbell, The Hero's Journey. So, so what's an example, like what's in the, in the motion picture world, the most famous modern version of The Hero's Journey? It's Star Wars. Star Wars, right? An old one is The Wizard of Oz, right? So, so Joseph Campbell, it's, it's um, if any of you guys ever heard of Nancy Duarte here in the Valley, she does a lot of stories. She, did, she was Steve Jobs' storytelling coach. She's phenomenal. She's written a, an amazing book called Resonate that I would highly recommend you read. Um, so if you think about what's the role of narrative, right? What, what is the entrepreneur really doing when they're being successful? In the Wizard of Oz, they're basically, they're creating Oz. They're convincing you that they're gonna create Oz, they're gonna create this magical emerald city, the ones who are very good. And your job, if you play it the other way as a venture capitalist, is to see Oz. And you might help them shape it a little bit, but at the end of the day, the entrepreneur needs to, needs to, own, that, um, needs to own that narrative. And the things, thing I observed in the industry, and this goes to 20, one years of doing this with fellows and just watching people in general is, is there's so many smart, critical people that it's a very easy trap to fall into to find out, okay, I can show you what's wrong with this. I can show you why this won't work or that won't work or this won't work. And it's such a cop out. It's so easy to do, right? Anybody with half a brain can find something that's wrong with any good venture deal because any good venture deal is, is crazy by definition, right? So how do you convert your mindset and how do you develop the muscles to become more imaginative? Right? And I've heard a bunch of the icons in the industry say, start asking yourself the question of what could go right. Not what could go wrong, what could go right? right? Uber was, what was Uber when it started? It was a limousine service, an on-call limousine service in San Francisco. Right? So why did Benchmark do that and nobody else? Because a lot of people passed on it. These guys. What's that? These guys, they just did it. Oh, which guys? Oh, Oh. <laughs> Bunch of people, yeah, a bunch of people did, right? So, and, and, but it, it, you, you have to start asking yourself questions around, around you know, automobile usage, who are you really, where's the opportunity really set, right? So, so now you've got, you know, 
you've got a situation, you're, you're, you're trying to build this amazing narrative. Um, what do we know about, what do we know about startups? You know, what do you know about great innovation, right? Never a solo job, right? It's always a, always a small group of people, very high speed, very unstructured, right? So have you guys ever thought about trust? and the, the design and execution of trust. Anybody, anybody a fan of Fernando Flores? He's a Chilean uh, technocrat who was imprisoned by the Pinochet regime and did a lot of writing while he was in prison. He's written some brilliant stuff on trust. And trust is often sort of equated with you're honest or dishonest. Um, I would equate it with lack of surprise. Right? Trust is based on alignment and setting expectations. And these are three areas where, where you can actually design technical trust. Right? What's motivating you? What's your agenda? What are you good at? And how do you show up? Which would you imagine is the toughest one? If somebody, if your partner were to surprise you, oh, there's, I can leave that there. Well, here, I'll, let me see if I can, if I can, yeah, look at that. Um, if you, were, if you had gone through this exercise with a partner and they surprised you in one of them, what do you think is the hardest one to recover from? I think silence because it's very sort of ingrained and inherent. Mm -hmm. so that would probably be the hardest point. Okay. I mean, I don't think there's any answer. Any other thoughts? Well, if they discover later, you have a hidden agenda. Hidden agenda. If you have a hidden well, agenda. Trust which yeah, so that, that can be a huge problem, yeah. Uh, maybe competencies because misinterpreting it could be like a personal offense. Yeah, I mean, if you, yeah, if you, if you say, say misinterpret it or you just don't show up as good as you say you're going to be, right? And I think it all comes down to a matter of style. And, and the other thing that, that you know about this situation is that most people, again, it goes back to most people don't know what they're good at. And most people think they're bad at things that they aren't bad at. Do you ever have a friend who says, oh, I'm really bad at this? You're like, no, you're not. And they have these sort of fears they build up in their head. Yeah, yeah Josh. Yeah, 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 right? Happens, I mean, it happens all the time. So I guess, um, Phil, just to challenge that a little bit further. So yep. um, trust, these are all important, three important aspects of it. So how did you decide to pick what your partner at Sergio Ventures, for example? So it, it, it's, it's a great question. So. Um, Ko and I, my partner Koichiro, um, we knew each other for a long time through Kaufman, and we he ran the. Were you there when we did the summit in Tokyo? Were there yet? I think you weren't weren't part of the program just yet. It was 2009, and we spent about um, a year and a half a year and a half building this big summit in Japan in June of 2009. Does anybody remember what happened in June of 2009 in Asia? No, sort of. It was a crisis. Did anybody remember what it was? No, you're getting closer though. It was a crisis. It was the 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 virus. Remember, the SARS. Is that what it was? SARS virus, I think. Or yeah, what's that? There was another one in 2009. I forget what it was. It, maybe that H1A. That's what it was. And so we had to we had to delay it until September. And so. I got to see him, because he had his whole reputation staked on this, and I got to see him sort of manage that process, and that was my first time when I said, that was a pretty major inflection point, because that could have really gone south, and he did a brilliant job of making a decision and putting it off and re-engineering the whole thing, and then over, as after we did that, we started talking about the fund, and we probably spent, we spent a year and a half, two years working on it, and so if, if someone, I get a, the, in the fellows network, there's, there's 474 fellows, and about 160 have launched their own funds. Ernestine's one of them, I'm one of them. They come a lot, and they say, hey, I want to start a fund. And so my, my standard answer is, okay, before you start a fund, tell me about your perfect deal. If you could do one deal right now that isn't done yet, what would that deal be? And I have them explain it to me. I say, okay, why don't you just go raise a little money and do that deal? with the person you want to do the fun with. See if you're any good, see if you like each other, see if you can actually do it. 
you know, a lot of times I say, well, I don't know if we can raise $2 million to do that. I was like, okay, but you're gonna raise 100 million for a whole fund and you can't raise two. So I did that exercise with Co. And we, we basically took a whiteboard and we wrote a few names like, what's the perfect deal? And he had LinkedIn and Twitter, sort of late stage stuff in Japan. And it ended up being Twitter. And we worked with Twitter for about a year and a half, taking them into Japan. And then we got a chance to invest um, and we put 25 million into it. And then that was successful. And then we said, okay, do we wanna start a fund? And that was a, probably a three and a half year process of getting to know each other. So now we're at a point where we, we still surprise each other a lot, but it's, it's manageable, right? So, does that answer the question? So, so here's, I'm almost done with these slides. Let me see what else I have here. So this is, this is like my little summary slide here, okay? Um, so this is, this is if, you, if you look at this, this is, this is kind of how I rationalize it in my mind. So the, the y-axis is impact, and that kind of means the impact of your organization can mean the size of the problem, the, the timeliness of the problem, the depth of the problem, you know, big idea. And, and time sort of represents you know, a, a, all resources, energy, cash, right? The, the more time you take, the more of everything it takes. And so generally where alignment happens with teams is around this idea of what is our odds, right? What's our big idea that we're gonna build and then the narrative arc, if you stay together, leads to something like how are we going to achieve customer delight and then how are we going to evolve some kind of a business model where we're going to get paid more than it costs us to delight the customer and scale it. Right? What I would argue is the teams that invest in culture and trust the most, well, actually what you want to do with that curve, obviously, is you want to, you want to get to impact as fast as you possibly can. And so culture and trust is a massive impact and has, it's a, there's a strong correlation with, with IRR because if you get to impact, you will get to financial return. So this is, I had, um, you might have heard this, Ernest, Ernestine, one of, one of the very best Kaufman fellows in the world uh, and best investors in the world, he, he, he made this comment to a class one time. He said, he said when I get new people into my <coughs> firm, I say, hey, you're gonna, you're gonna do 1,500 interactions this year as an associate in this firm. And maybe three of them could change your life, could change your career. And the question is, how do you know which one? It's only 0.2% of those interactions, right? Now, these are rough numbers, but they're probably pretty accurate. How do you know which one? So there's only two ways you can do it. One is like be ridiculously perceptive, or the other one is show up ready, show up fit. And so this is kind of a quick, stack of the things that we see. So, so I, my advice to you in any meeting you do is to try to get as far up this stack as you possibly can. So self, put yourself out there as much as you're comfortable putting yourself out there. Vulnerability is incredibly powerful. This is who I am. This is what I love to do. This is what I think I'm good at. This is what I want to build. This is what makes me tick. All right. And hopefully the person on the other side of the table will do the same thing. My advice is, if you don't get that data right up front, I don't see why, you know, if, if you're in a professional meeting, I don't see the point. Because then you have no chance of creating any sort of depth of trust or depth of relationship, and you can't compete. And you're, 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 you're in the average, why do it? Okay? Once you have that data, there are a lot of tools you can use to create alignment. There's tools you can use to design and trust. And then what do we, what do we know about any team's first idea? for the most part. What happens to the first idea a team comes up with? It sucks, yeah, yeah. It gets evolved, it sucks, it doesn't work, right? It, it, there's, I think the correlation's like, I think the inverse correlation's like 99% or something of, of, of first ideas, right? So what is influence other than just realigning, right? Creating true realignment is true influence. What tends to happen in those moments of pivot? How does it go wrong, do you think, in a team? If they, you know, they, they don't get the influence piece right, what, what happens? What could happen? People disagree. Sometimes you're about to break. They could disagree and they just, they could split up. What if they, what if, what if they, what if you leave the room thinking everybody's on the same page but they aren't? What could go, what, what could, what could cause that? Because they're not listening to each other? They're not in sync. What, what are some of the behavioral, like think about, have you ever seen this happen? 
Like what actually happens when that, what happens when teams leave unaligned but everyone's sort of nodding their head that they are? What's you, what are some of the catalysts? I know you've all seen it. Yes, Simon? I mean, it's just like a social thing. You want to appease someone, you don't want to be like argumentative. Like, you want to argue with someone, so you just like agree, but yeah. you don't really believe in the same thing. Yeah, people just, they don't want to confront. They, they might not be the personality to, to disagree, right? What's the flip side of that? When you actually agree. Well, there's no, what's the flip, what, what, what's the kind of person that creates that reticence often? Loudmouth, right? Person with the loudest voice in the room. Like, this is what we're going to do. And everyone goes, yeah, yeah, this is what we'll do. But they're like, and then they get out and they start whispering and gossiping. And, oh, here comes the drama, right? I don't know. I, I know you guys have all seen this. Oh, I can't believe he said, uh, this is, I don't want to do this, right? And here comes the drama. He's a villain. He's, he's, I'm a victim, whatever it may be, right? So it happens all the time. And then do you want to have your money invested in that company? Right? And they show up at the board and they practice and they look like they're all aligned. And then all the board members are looking like something smells funny here. And, and it, you see it all the time. Would you want to invest your life in it? I don't think so. So anyway, so, so my summary. So I would say, you know, whether you're going to take venture or you're going to be in venture, being smart and hardworking is just, just get you in the door. Um, Success, I would argue, getting into that top five, top 10% is all about creating a system of, of access. I think that access is driven by your brand. And I like to be very clear about this. I, I, this is, again, this is not my definition, but I love this definition of brand because I think especially um, either non-native speakers or non-Americans sometimes see brand as, as hype or promotion. And that's not the definition that I like. Um, I like this definition of promise of experience. Right? Your, brand is, your brand is what it is to be with you. And so it takes a long time to build a brand, and it's really easy to destroy. And that's why the fitness thing comes in. Is it is, you know, uh, mechanical engineers or engineers, right? Second, second law of thermodynamics, right? The most useful thing I ever learned in, in college was, was entropy, right? Really easy to destroy that. The promise is you. Memories, all of your brand, memories of you are all built in inflection points. No one pays attention when the sun is shining, right? They, wanna, they pay attention when, when the storms are blowing, right? And so be at maximum fitness. So that's what I have on the slides. Um, 15 minutes-ish. Um, let me just, let me, let's look through these really quick. Um, no, it's good. No, so you've never seen my writing. Uh, so, so the first, let's just the first question. Is, is VC an old boys network? I, I think it used to be, but I, I think it's changing really rapidly. Um, and, I, and I think it has to because it, it used to make sense. When I started in 1995, the vast majority of stuff that got bought was bought by kind of middle managers and tech companies. The vast majority of who were engineers, the vast majority of who were basically white and Asian males. And so the entrepreneurs looked that way and the venture capitalists looked that way. That's my, that's my best case scenario. There's a lot of other things in there around bias and I think you know, unappealing behavior that made that even worse. But I think now what's happening with technology is, is it's, the buyer space is becoming so diverse that you're, you're seeing the entrepreneurs follow suit and you're seeing venture capital funds follow suit. What we did at Kaufman, we started this in 1995, this initiative, to, our, our, our mission was, was create a leadership cadre that better reflected the entrepreneurial community and society as a whole. And we created a highly integral selection process. We didn't actually have any quotas or anything, but we radically outperformed the industry with regards to women, people of color. We were the first to bring in scientists, doctors, operators. Back in 95, it was still a business of investment bankers and consultants. So I think that's been good. The, the untoward behavior, you know, you brought up that case. I won't, I won't say it because I don't, I don't want it to be on the film. Um, you know, it's, I, I, think for, I think for the most part, the business does a pretty good job of self-regulating. I think the challenge that we have now, this, is, this would be my observation about the industry. When I started, 
it was roughly in 95, it was roughly like a four, four billion, four and a half billion dollar industry globally. And I think if you add it all up 20 years later, if you add up venture, angel, corporate, China, and China corporate venture, um, it's, it's hard to measure, but it's somewhere between 250 and 300 billion, I think. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a 60 to almost 80x increase in size in 20 years. And I don't think the industry is quite caught up with that yet. That how prevalent we've become. We used to be this kind of weird corner of the universe, and now we're the center of the universe. And so I think we're going to need to adjust to that. I think it's important as an industry that we, we police ourselves, because that particular situation was unpleasant. Um, I think I talked about the role industry. How do, um, I think, Anji, you asked, how do you take the best of Silicon Valley and repot it? Um, I think it's a mistake to take a fund that looks like this and put it there. I think what Silicon Valley does really well is it figures out what the customer wants. And so if you, you know, if you look at what, for example, the Singaporean government is doing with some of the initiatives out of Tomasic with the young funds, I think those are very thoughtful. They're creating, there's, I think they're sitting there and saying, what do our, what do our entrepreneurs need in terms of capital? What is the pace at which funds can invest? Um, and and you, you can get those numbers and you can derive the right size fund and then what do those managers need to look like and recruit those managers. I think when you do that, I think there's a very good chance if you, if you create the right kind of size and velocity of fund, it's great. And then the other key is to get them connected because these entrepreneurs need to be connected around the world. That would be my answer there. Um, what kind of criteria do you use to evaluate? So I'll, I'll, you know, I'll tell you what we do. We, we have a, our bias is pretty simple. We like, um, we like, we like really big markets, um, big potential markets. T like TAM is a really weird thing because I always get, get you know, it's always cracks me up when people go, there's a billion dollar TAM for this space. I'm like, no, there's not. I mean, there's, there's like a $200 million TAM, right? It's, there's this massive market, but it's really hard to actually access what's really available. Um, we like big, messy markets. We like technology savvy. We like really difficult sales environments. And then we look at teams that have deep, deep industry expertise. That's, that's kind of, I don't think we think that much more about it. There's other things that go into it. And I think if you talk to any venture capitalist, they all have different, different things that they, they like and don't like. Um, and that's, I mean, that's how we, we evaluate teams based on their, on the depth of their buyer um, knowledge. Let's see. So, what do you think we can do to improve the VC ecosystem? I mean, that's such a big question. Um, it's a great question. I think, um, I, I, I think it's really weird that it's, it's changed a little bit in the last few years, which is great. But I think for many, many years, our little organization was the only thing that did anything in the way of formal training and venture capital. And, and that just seems crazy to me. It's, such, it's, it's, it's a pretty big industry at a couple hundred billion dollars, but it's so important. And so you're now finally starting to see, like Berkeley does some stuff. There's a ton of stuff at Stanford that's available to the students, but it's not as industry-wide. Um, Brad Feld just started doing some stuff. But I, I, think we need a, like, I think we need orders of magnitude more flow of information and training, because there's just so much to learn. This is like one little corner of the world that, that we know, or I know. Um, so I think that's, that's probably you know, the biggest thing, is, is education and also getting to a mindset. Um, I still don't think everybody who writes checks thinks of themselves in service of entrepreneurs. And until you get to that place, like you, you need to think of yourself like a doctor. You know, if the doctor walks into your room and you're sick and the doctor says, this, this interaction is about me, not you, I would be really scared. I'd want my doctor to be thinking about me as the point of focus. And I think that's a reasonable metaphor for venture capital. Um, on the corporate side, I, um, we talked a little bit about this. I think the corporates have gotten really smart. The old joke used to be they came in late, paid up, and then they sold on the downside. Um, I still think that stigma exists in the institutional venture world, and I think it's very dangerous. I think corporations have gotten so smart. They've gotten this, the, the idea of being involved in, in venture capital 
uh, has bubbled up to the corner office, to the CEO's office for the most part. Um, they've staffed very well. They've got long-term commitment. Um, they're integrating their business units. Um, they're, I think they're, they're out competing a lot of the institutional venture capitalists. And, and anybody have a guess of how many, the estimate of how many corporations have a venture practice? It's pretty amazing. Throw out a number. How many corporations have some kind of a venture practice? It's a good guess. About 1,500. Like most people go like, 100? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's getting to that level, like the Russell 3000. You know, it used to be just Intel and, you know, and, and Novartis and a couple other massive giants had it. But everybody's starting to play now. And that's, I think, to me, because I know a lot of these people, it's one of the largest contributors to the traffic problems around here is you've got a lot of corporate venture coming in and they're, they're here to stay. Um, how to use your strategy, that's the last question there. How does strategy take low periods into account? Um, I think, I think the, the, we're probably not different from anybody else, is you kind of don't really pay that much attention to low periods other, other than, like, I think most venture capitalists get nervous in frothy environments because you almost can't go wrong if you buy a great company at a fair price, but you can go wrong if you buy a good company at a high price. And so what you end up, you know, you tend to get, it's this really kind of um, double-edged sword where if your timing is such, you've got a lot of mature companies and, and the markets are robust, it is, it's the most fun you'll ever see. Like, you know, just company after company goes and exits. Um, but if not, I think a lot of people get nervous. I think what most funds do is they try to develop a lot of discipline. They communicate very well with their LPs. You get LPs who are in for the long haul and they know that you know, don't panic when they see you're in a downturn and you might be, you know, you might be in that hockey stick mode where your, your fund doesn't look like it's performing that well. You know, but I think most, I think it's, you know the old joke, it's another sailing joke of there's no such thing as inclement weather, only in proper clothing. You know, so I think it's that kind of thing of you just, you show up for the long haul and behave that way. And I think that's how most funds would handle it. Do you find yourself making more or fewer investments Cycle. Making, do you find yourself making like more, making more, more, fewer more investments? Fewer investments? Y y sure, uh, sure. It'll definitely influence you. Ideally, you want to make more investments. Sure, yeah. sure. You, you, you would, yes. And, and I think ideally, that's right. You would want to be more aggressive in what you think is a downturn. Um, and and you, you, you tend to see the, the, you'll hear this from a lot of people saying, some, some funds will just say, this is so crazy, we're just staying on the sidelines for two years. And the track record of those funds is not very good. So you have to stay active, but you do need to become more selective when things are frothy. But um, there's a professor on my board, Steve Kaplan from the University of Chicago. He's one of the, probably the premier quant thinkers and he's a macroeconomist and he's done a lot of the groundbreaking work in venture. And I remember he came in and did a talk in 2010, 2011. People were still bruised and beat up and he said, without a doubt, based on the flow of capital into the market, the 2008, 2009, 2010 are going to be record-breaking vintages. And people looked at him like he was from outer space. But he uses a metric as the amount of money as a function of GDP. I think below, I think the 0.2% of GDP is kind of where, the, you know, above that you start to see numbers approach, and you know, the overall industry numbers approach kind of typical indices. And if it's below that, the performance of funds goes way up. And for those years, it was like 0.1. It was like some of the lowest in a long time as a function of GDP. And those funds of that vintage have just blown it out because you're, you've got more time, you can be more selective, and prices are better. And there's no competition. So you get all the best stuff. So it's a great question. So I think we have four minutes left. Yeah, sure. Oh, there are? Oh, hey. Okay. Let's see. Well, I said what I think about accelerators. I, I, so I'll just reiterate. I, the, 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 the thing I was, I was pondering in my mind is, you know, I do this a quick math of, of you know, the, what's the global GDP is like 200 trillion, something like that, 190 trillion is the global GDP. I think it's like 10x the US GDP. And, and so if you use, you know, a base number of 3% in R&D, and how much, if you're, if you're running a corporation, how much of your R&D would you put into labs versus into sort of open innovation and venture and outside? What would be your breakdown? Off the top of your head. 
Just throw a number out. I'm not going to place it. Probably 20% of in innovation in R&D. Twenty to thirty percent. No, no, in, in, in internal R and D versus open R and D. How much, like into open labs and relationships and venture? Where would you allocate your money? Uh, more on internal R and D. Okay. Okay. So what's the number? Like 20, 25 percent? Yeah, like twenty percent on internal and about five to ten percent on open. Okay. So I mean, if you start running those numbers, you know, it's still, you know, it, it, we're still far from capacity, and so I think you're going to see more accelerators, more seed investors, as industry cycles get compressed, as product cycles get compressed, what we do in this world is gonna get, is gonna get more and more important. Um, so I think, I think you're gonna see more accelerators. I think you know, there's, a couple of, there's a couple, more than a couple of cool food accelerators in New York um, that, that do sort of consumer packaged good stuff. I think you're gonna see there's a number of vertical industries that I think are gonna get disrupted and you'll see specialized accelerators there. Um, <laughs> I'll do that. I'll do the last one last. Vision about the hottest emerging technologies. I mean, I, you know, I'm not much of a prognosticator. Um, it, I do, you know, I, I guess I, one of the things that really fascinates me is food in general. There's just so much upside in food in so many different ways. Um, so I don't, you know, there, there's this idea that we'll colonize Mars and somebody will probably figure that out. But I think we're going to see, for us, the things we look at and the things we like are more about the integration of existing technologies into new business models, like Uber. You know, there's nothing about Uber that's really all that new, but it's the integration of so many other infrastructures that's very clever. I was like Domino's Pizza 30 years ago, like, you know, combine the telephone system, pizza ovens, and in the, in the highway system, and you've got a totally new business model for how you eat pizza. Um, I don't know, I, I'd be more curious to hear what you guys have to say about that. Um, let's see, the, the, the companies I wish I had in my portfolio, probably the one that bothers me the most was, was PayPal. I mean, I could have gotten into PayPal and I, couldn't, I could not get it through the partnership. And Peter Thiel and I had like 15 meetings and this is back when he was in a little office on University Avenue. Um, and that one haunts you because not only was it PayPal, but it has the whole diaspora of PayPal. It's like how many other great deals would have come out of that? Um, and that's, you know, I remember my, my boss told me, and it's, maybe it's the advice I'll leave you guys with, um, my first boss in venture said, if you really believe in something, fight tooth and nail to get it done. Because you won't remember the bad deals, but you'll remember the deal that you love that you didn't get done. And it's so true, because sometimes I'll go through my closet and I'll see a company and I'll just go, oh God, like some golf shirt from some horrible deal. It's like a $3 million golf shirt, right? Because that's all I have to show for it. <laughs> and I, you're like, oh God, I completely forgot about that, but I still remember PayPal. You know, I still, I, ah, I can't believe I didn't get in that deal. There's a couple of others, but you know, there, there's, you know we, all, we all have them, so. Anyway, um, wow, that was, that was good. Right on the, right on the button. So, um, uh, thank uh, you again for the oh, answer. That is too awesome.